Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'd also like to thank uh, Albert for all the wonderful work that he's done putting us together. He's really been the glue that's uh, helped make this conference happen uh, over the last several years. Uh, so if you could please join me in thanking him as well. Okay, now that we've got the human out of the loop, um, let's talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, or as our friends at Google refer to it as uh, machine intelligence. So <clears throat> AI has actually been around for quite some time. In fact, the promise of AI has uh, been held out there for uh, quite some time, most recently in the 90s, where it was massively oversold. And then at the time, the technology just wasn't there to support uh, its effective delivery, at least uh, on the hype that was uh, put out there. Now today you have, and some of these are well-known uh, figures, you know, China's investing a significant amount of money. They say it's $150 billion. Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin has said that whoever owns uh, AI, whoever achieves AI, which is really effectively four levels, right? Level one is Siri, level four is Skynet. Uh, whoever uh, owns AI will own the world. Um, recently there was a, uh, a major uh, AI research uh, conference and in that conference, uh, they uh, actually had to move the entire conference from, I believe it was New Orleans to San Francisco. And the reason why is they scheduled it over Chinese New Year, and the event would have had no attendees, or at least major research attendees, uh, without the reschedule uh, of the conference. So this is a problem. This is a problem not just from a national security perspective, but also from a, uh, an American supremacy perspective, if you care about investment in next generation technology. So uh, as Albert has already mentioned, I'm joined here by uh, three individuals who have a distinct uh, knowledge base uh, on uh, artificial intelligence, and you can, you can read about their bios uh, more uh, in your booklets that uh, you've been given. But maybe just to start out, uh, Mike, <coughs> as, uh, you know, as you have a, a variety of these countries digging into the artificial intelligence space, at least in not just in terms of basic research, but also applied research and, and building them in the military programs. Are we in a new artificial intelligence arms race uh, from your perspective? Well, there might be an artificial intelligence arms race, but we're not yet in it. Mm -hmm. um, the national defense strategy released in January calls that out, as calls AI out as one of the modernization areas, one of the key modernization areas. Uh, for exactly the reasons you just you just quoted Russia's Putin and quoted a budget figure for China, I think our adversaries and and they are our adversaries. I think they understand very well uh, the possible future utility of machine learning, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think it's time we did as well. Great, Ivana, uh, uh, China and Russia they have a national AI strategy. Uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates and, and France uh, are, have released or are just releasing theirs. Where is our AI, AI strategy? And uh, um, as, a, as a person who runs an artificial intelligence company yourself, you know, what can the commercial uh, space uh, uh, be doing more to submit, uh, support people like Pat and Mike? So in 2016, President Obama actually released a national AI R&D strategies, about, I think, 30-some pages. You can find it on the White House website. I mean, it really goes into why we need to focus on AI. But one thing that it does not do is does not talk about the implementation. So we can talk about how maybe the commercial sector within the US is actually winning the AI war. But when it comes, but if the technology is not being used, you know, what's the point of having it, right? Um, and I think that's something that we really want to work on. And I think as, a, as someone who's working in the AI space, a lot of times engaging with policymakers, or even talking to senior military officials about AI, we basically have to educate them first. Like, this is AI, and this is how it's different from machine learning, and this is where we're at, and here are sort of you know, the pros and the cons and all these things, and I think the more time we spend educating them is the time that we're not spending trying to advance AI. We're trying to think about how can we actually implement this in our strategic vision. Interesting. So Pat, uh, as a CTO of uh, one of the largest uh, defense corporations out there, from your perspective, building you know, enterprise level systems, can we afford to be a fast follower in this space? So. Um 
you know, just like every piece of technology, you, you can't lead every part of, you know, the whatever the technology capability is, but you can choose to lead in the application of artificial intelligence and or machine learning into the defense space. And I think that's the decision that we have to make. We have to be committed to that. There's a whole stack of technologies that exist, you know, all the way from, you know, how to organize data, how to curate, get, get large, large sets of data, to the fundamental hardware resource that allows you to either train or do inference in, in real time. You know, all these things contribute to the, to the possibility of taking AI and integrate it in our weapon systems future. That's where we have to make a decision. This is this strategy that uh, Mike and Ivana have been talking about. We've got to make that decision to be committed to that and to start. Uh, I mean, we've been doing it for, you know, we've, been ha we've had neural nets in classifiers yeah. for years. You know, I've, I've seen them uh, back in the 90s and they didn't work all that great uh, for a number of reasons, but we're seeing now uh, led by um, some advances in the commercial industry, that there's great promise in critical areas of, of what could be the defense and, and uh, space that artificial intelligence and machine learning could have dramatic uh, impact on what we need to do. I mean, machines can do certain things much better than humans can, and if we can get enough of that reasoning in the machine stack, I think we can make our job, you know, in terms of the defense department mission, much simpler. So as a, to follow up on that, Ivana, um, you know, running a private sector company, um, what, what would you like to see come out of the, either the Department of Defense or Heritage Industrial Players uh, like, uh, like Mike's company, uh, sorry, Pat's company, sorry, uh, in, in terms of enabling uh, the onshoring of uh, innovative technology? Everyone talks about innovation, much like they talk about AI as if it's like a cereal box to be purchased on the, you know, on the, um, the at the supermarket store, but from my perspective, I, I still struggle often to understand what the actual mechanisms are or could be, especially when we have an acquisition system that uh, it, it equates roughly with Moore's law. I think at a system level, it's interesting because I was at Andrews last week, and it was the strategic multi-layer multi assessment, and um, a couple of the. 06 and the generals who were there were talking about this interesting thing, which is that since the 1960s, we have won battles, and to a certain extent, we won wars, but we certainly have not won any strategic vision. I think this is something that JSOC also said publicly. Um, and one, and the reason, one of the reasons behind the reason why, the, you know, why we're not actually winning any strategic vision is because the monitoring and the evaluation system that we have is fundamentally biased because we want to say that the things that we created work. Well, AI is sort of there to kind of take that human bias out. Um, so, that it, so that is almost like a fundamental shift that I think DOD and a lot of the, um, you know, this industrial base can really help with is how can we actually think about using AI to do something like that. And then I think on a micro level, it is about the acquisition process. And so, I mean, AI, there's new technology coming out every six months, every four months, right? If your typical acquisition process is gonna take at least eight to 12 months, if you're lucky, then by the time you know, something's gonna land in the end user's hand, it's three generations behind. So how can we actually reform that? Yeah, I, I, that's a really interesting uh, point. And if you think about uh, some of the promise in machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, you're gonna make an acquisition decision based on what you think has the best compliance to a set of requirements, but yet you, you're gonna have machines that could continue to learn and improve their performance over time. Uh, and so how, you know, it's gonna be hard, you know, make a decision, an acquisition decision, and then you've gotta live with it, and then, you know, it turns out that the machine that you decided was not good enough may be better mm. in six months because of some improvement that could happen as a result of it being trained better. Sure. Mike, uh, or, I don't know if you wanted to answer any of those. I've, I've got another good one for you. Well, let me, let me talk for a moment about the acquisition system. Please. Because both Ivana and Pat have mentioned that. Um, there's a, a bit of a reality cold water bath that, that we in the national security community uh, need to immerse ourselves. 
And that is that we can, in, in the world we have today, we can either maintain our process or we can maintain preeminence. But we probably can't do both. Mm. Um, we, we need to be able to move inside the decision loop of our adversaries. Yeah. And our adversaries are not burdened by the acquisition system we have that has grown up really since uh, post-World War II days, mm. starting with the you know, development of the ICBM and so on. And it has just gotten more and more protracted. Um, in, in my couple of times as a corporate CEO, um, I'm, I'm well aware of the difference between the decision-making process. As a, as a CEO, I have to please my board, okay, and I have to find a way to please the market. Hmm. All right, but I don't, in making decisions about which chip to buy or which piece of software to buy or anything like yeah. that, I don't have to be fair. I don't have to give all parties a, a equal access. I don't have to entertain protests. Um, I don't have to pick the lowest bidder. <laughs> you know, I'm responsible for picking that which I think is going to advance my corporation's interests. Sure. Um, I'd better guess right, or I might not be the CEO for very long, but that's the criterion. Um, our acquisition system is built for a period of time in which, first of all, American preeminence was not really questioned. We were striving to contain the Soviet Union. They weren't striving to contain us. They were striving to break, trying, striving to break out. Um, China is on the rise, but they're on the rise against our established position. So everything we've done has been in, in seven decades since the end of World War II has been done in a context in which American preeminence was not questioned and we had the luxury of, of time to make decisions as if others couldn't catch up. Uh, now we know that they, or we should know that they can. Mm -hmm. And we, we can either devote ourselves to the maintenance of the structure that we have, or we can devote ourselves to uh, remaining on top. But that's the choice we face. Um, if the consideration for national security officials is I have to figure out a way to be fair to everybody rather than picking who I think can do the best job and living with those consequences, then we're always going to be behind and, and so many other things. If I have to structure my accounting system <laughs> to be you know, balanced within the penny, if, 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 if uh, many of us in this room you know, live all that, if I have to maintain all of that process, then we probably cannot stay ahead of our adversaries. It reminds me of a quote by Winston Churchill who said, uh, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all other options. Um. <coughs> and Churchill was half an American. His mom was American. So I, th I think he knew us well. Truer words have never been spoken. Um, this is a comment that was mentioned, and this is back to you, Mike, again. Um, a comment that was uh, picked up on earlier today. Um, in uh, late 2016, uh, a couple of F-18s launched a swarm of uh, um, 103 uh, Perdix micro drones. So shortly thereafter, China responded with a swarm of uh, 119 drones. Um, so one of the things that concerns me personally is less you know, who, who has more drones in the air, and it's more about the ability of artificial intelligence to enable uh, those platforms, however big or small they are. So uh, Mike, from your perspective, um, how should these data points, you know, number of drones in the air, number of un unmanned or assisted or remotely piloted vehicles out there, um, uh, logistics uh, capabilities, how, how should all these uh, data points inform what our future forest structure investment priorities sh uh, should look like, and should they change from the day? Well, I, I think drone, swarming drone attacks, um, which have recently become possible and in fact are occurring in theater uh, in the Mideast, I think these drone attacks give an example where, in, in fact, AI can be very helpful because, you know, certainly um, 
human-directed weapon systems can deal with one or two or a few drones mm -hmm. uh, if they, you know, see them coming. Um, but can they deal with 103? If if they can deal with 103, which I doubt, can they deal with a thousand? Mm -hmm. and, and so you reach a point where it is inevitable to say that the response to such attacks must be automated. If it's going to be automated, then it it will have to be reasoned. Mm. If it is going to be automated and reasoned, now you're talking about AI. And in <laughs> fact, the ability to go after such swarms is a, a classic example of the traveling salesman problem. I mean, there's no provable, optimal scheme for doing it. You have to do a pretty good scheme. Mm. But failing to implement a pretty good scheme is, means you're probably going to lose because the enemy will also have a pretty good scheme for attacking. Hmm. And if we don't, you know, if we don't think our way through those kinds of issues, I mean, that's, that to me is a, an early and I think what will prove to be a classic example of the military uh, utility of AI. So this is a perfect tie-in. Uh, Ivana, um, Deputy Secretary uh, Bob Work, uh, in one of his last speeches, uh, said surprise is going to be endemic because a lot of weapon system advances, uh, we aren't going to fight them, or we won't see them until we fight them. And if they have AI that's better than ours, that's going to be a bad day, end quote. So I guess my, uh, picking off of what Mike was just talking about, how can DOD work with uh, the industrial base as well as leading uh, commercial players to counter uh, what he calls endemic surprise? How can we uh, work to get ahead of not just the investments, but also the employment of a lot of these technologies? And, and does, to what extent does um, morality as an American play into this, uh, given that other countries seem not to be as encumbered by that? Or are we too moral? Hmm. I, well, first of all, I don't think I would agree with the endemic surprises. I think it's, the markers are out there. We just, you just have to know where to look, right? So for a lot of folks, I think the Russian influence and the, the way they're using bots and um, the information warfare right, um, that they used against the West, against us, uh, was a surprise. But I think if you were actually tracking it from the anti-vaxxers all the way onward, it was not a surprise at all where they were coming from and all that. Um, can you repeat the last part of your question? Are we too moral? Oh yeah. So uh, <laughs> not sure of the connection there, but okay. <laughs> I mean, I like a AI is is technology. So I'll talk about technology in the broader term, which is technology is neither good nor bad. It's all about how you use it, right? So it's never it's not going to change someone's intent. It's just going to catalyze it and help that person realize that goal faster. Mm. And so it could be bots. It could be you know it could be drones. It could be whatever. Um, I think, and, and it's really hard to control how someone's going to use technology. I mean, for, you know, we developed quadcopters and people use them to take photos of, or videos of their weddings, but you could also be <coughs> Dash and you can also use it to create your own mesh network in Mosul, right? So all of these things, so I mean, I think that yes, in the US, we're probably a little bit too concerned about, oh, like, how can we control how someone's using our technology where, you know, we don't want to open up this can of worm, but eventually, I mean, I understand that side of the argument, but eventually someone else is going to open that can of worm and they're going to own it. And so I feel like it's much better for us to actually get ahead of that and then start to think, okay, now that I'm five steps ahead of everyone else, maybe I can control it, maybe not, because there's a a bigger chance that I might not, but at least I can have some kind of a say instead of having no say. Got it. Pat, uh, how, can, how can large uh, defense corporates enable uh, both Mike's intent as uh, the CTO of the, the Department of Defense, mm -hmm. um, and uh, as well as uh, people like uh, Ivana and, and what she's doing and others out there in the commercial space who candidly don't really, uh, and we talked about this before, yeah. they don't really have a desire to even engage with the U.S. government. You know, they're not, a, they're not interested in, you know, developing a, uh, a DCAA compliant, uh, you know, system or being subject or even understanding what uh, the FAR is. 
like what what can what can uh, Northrop, as an example, do uh, in this space from a technology keep, perspective? Keep them far away from the far, I guess. That's a yeah. Type of thought. <laughs> no, um, it, it turns out that um, I think there's a very useful space that allows, and and, uh, and I think to Mike's earlier, um, you know, con encourages the possibility, the potential that you know there's an economic motive, you know, that exists for U.S. companies to do well. Uh, and then there's a national security motive that suggests that we want our national security apparatus to do well and protect our ability to have that economic capability. Uh, it, it, at the very, uh, sort of at the fundamentals of technology, it's very useful for us to collaborate together and broadly with members of the more commercially uh, defined uh, technology space. Uh, and, and quite often we find ourselves in um, a really nice position where our commercial motivations, you know, we're selling to our customer, you know, and defense and security customers, they're probably not, and they don't understand how to do that. Um, we can be that vector for that technology, you know, to our customer base, and yet we can collaborate in ways that can drive the under underlying technology to be better for the broader economic and um, uh, defense and security missions. So I think there's quite a natural matching you know at the technology level we also happen to have some of the some very interesting uh, and demanding problems that allow us to stretch you know the, tech, the underlying technology and discover its limitations or its benefits in critical areas so I think there's a lot of reasons why we can and should work together uh, in sort of a symbiotic way to drive the the economic and the security needs of our, of our country, and we're, we're delighted we, we do that um, uh, in our space. And I suspect uh, our peers also do similar. And I guess as a follow-up question, both for you and Ivana as well, um, you know, we've, we've enjoyed, I, I guess, a, a, a richness of technology here in the United States that um, quite understandably has given us a, um, a not in, what's it saying, a not invented here syndrome, mm -hmm. where uh, we tend to view not just technologies, but the concepts of employment uh, of those technologies as, um, as solely existing here in the United States as a, as a source. Um, given the development of technolo emerging technologies, especially AI, um, wh what's your perspective or do you have any thoughts on what you're seeing uh, coming out of places and being and, and concepts of employment for those technologies in places not named the United States of America. Yeah, I I would say you know my my view, especially with uh, things like AI, is there's been a, a huge democratization of the underlying technology, uh, and that you know it's going to allow um, uh, achievements. It's going to allow um, you know uh, new applications. It's going to allow. Um, new discoveries to be made very broadly across across the, the world, and I think we have to be present uh, in that global uh, technology commons. We have to understand it. We have to use it, uh, and because you know, if we don't, and there's better technology somewhere else, uh, we're going to be disadvantaged. We don't want to ever enter into a fight where our our weapon systems, our machines, are at a disadvantage. So we want to understand that technology very broadly and, and see how we can make use of it uh, inside of our own, um, you know, procurement. Vana? Um, I would agree with that, but at the same time, there's a part of me that also looks at the other side, which is that, you know, AI essentially, let's just boil AI down to algorithms, right? They're very different types of algorithms, but they're algorithms, which means that anyone really with a laptop mm -hmm. can compute it and they can create an AI, right? Uh, <laughs> which is a scary part, but at the same time, if you want to do really, really cool AI, you need a lot of computing power, which, is, which brings me to China, right? China, before they banned Bitcoins, they were mining probably almost like half of the Bitcoins, mm -hmm. right? And so think about how much computing power they have just hidden like everywhere, and they can totally just redirect that into AI and start to like create super, super computers to crunch all the data and all that stuff. And we know for a fact that China collects a lot of data from everybody, right? Um, and so that's sort of a concern. Hmm. 
Yeah, I heard recently that uh, <clears throat> I remember growing up uh, reading about stories of the uh, China's attempt to kind of seed the clouds to make it rain in certain parts of the country, if any of you remember that as well. And uh, I heard uh, recently that um, apparently now they're doing it, but using artificial intelligence to do micro-targeting uh, to be, I guess, much, much more successful. So, I mean, that's kind of a random segue, but Mike, g given what Ivana and Pat have said, um, you, you've had a, a distinguished uh, career holding a number of different positions, it, uh, multiple agencies and companies. When we talk about AI, um, I mean, I, I've ridden the wave of big data, if you remember back when that was cool, or cybersecurity, um, also another monolithic term uh, to describe a whole number of things. Um, now we're in the middle of the, uh, the latest AI craze. Um, from your experience, I, I, either currently or when, in your past assignments, what have you seen that could work or could be a useful mechanism or a useful process for helping onshore the, um, some of this advanced artificial intelligence technology that people keep saying that they want? Well, let me con comment on that in the context of Pat's and Ivana's remarks. Um, Pat said, you know, we've seen the democratization of AI. And Ivana commented that, you know, if you have a laptop, you can do AI. Um, it's a, I might rephrase the same thing and say, it is a field with low capital barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a whole bunch of computers are a great idea, but if you've got one and you're clever, you can do something. And, you know, who, who knows uh, what the invention will be uh, that, that really takes off. I mean, you know, Sergey Brin and Larry Page didn't start with rooms full of computers. Um, you know, Einstein worked out relativity using nothing more than algebra and an inquisitive nature or inquisitive mind about the nature of the universe. Yeah, so that it's, sounds pretty straightforward. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's it's really difficult in 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 endeavors to s that are inherently low capital intensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's really difficult to say, you know, who is going to make the next major advance, where it will come from, how powerful it can become. So to that extent, when you talk about onshoring such things, yeah, it, it's, it's nice to have lots of compute power and, and all that stuff, but what we really need to do is to have a, a climate which wants to attract the best minds. Mm. Um, a, a fear of mine has been that since 9-11, we have um, really clamped down on uh, the a number of different ways in which the United States used to be attractive to the best and brightest. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we still are. I mean, a country that has people clamoring to get here is a, a better arrangement than having a country where people are trying to get out. Mm -hmm. But we're not always doing, uh, with regard to our immigration policies, the kinds of things that would cause people to want to come here, get a great education, uh, and stay here. Sure. Um, so for, for, for areas that are, you know, my native field is, is space and <laughs> rocketry and things like that. Well, those are highly capital intensive systems. AI is not, and, and the rules of how you progress are very different in those systems, and I think we should take notice of that. Hmm. Well, and I'm really glad you said that because I, realizing that you're not the, the PNR, uh, uh, a question I'd love to ask you, and, and the genesis of this is um, uh, the saying that says, you, you, know you're, you know that you're avoiding innovation theater when the, the budget for innovation comes out of the, the CTO's budget instead of the chief marketing officer's budget. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so along those lines, uh, what's the incentive for defense personnel uh, or, and, and the corresponding civilians to understand or have basic AI literacy, right? Maybe not know how to, you know, you know, go to a general assembly class and learn how to code in Python, but at least have basic technical literacy around things such as AI, but not only, not, not only specific to that, um, when they can be promoted without it. I mean, from a CTO's perspective, what's, uh, what's your perspective on that? Well, I'm, I'm hardly just the department CTO. That's one of my legal responsibilities, but I also have line organizations in, say, missile defense, 
DARPA both report to my office. Um, DARPA, of course, spans the waterfront on uh, their whole mission in life is to uh, prevent technological surprise by the United States and to cause surprise for others across a wide range of activities. So um, I, I personally think we can't, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that there are many dimensions of national security. We have to add a new one without losing the others. Without, or else I have to lose it to it without losing our. I think you're back on audio visual. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so this is a discipline that we have to add on. I, I don't have a problem that people can be promoted to high levels without working knowledge of AI. What I want to see is that working knowledge or even even great expertise in AI will be sufficient to, for people to be promoted. I, I don't want to go to a place where you can't get anywhere unless you're AI literate. Um, that might not be that useful to people who are trying to help us develop ever more quiet submarines, for example. Sure. So let's not get head up and locked on the shiny penny. Uh, we need to add AI to our quiver. I think all of us have been yeah. very clearly clear about that. It needs to be a new arrow in the quiver, but it's not the only arrow. So I guess as a follow-up, and, and, and any of you can take this one, um, <coughs> What concerns me about artificial intelligence, uh, you know, it's kind of a this time is different uh, um, monologue, it, is the fact that it enables, <clears throat> really what it enables is hyper war. I mean, we talk about hybrid warfare, right, with the little green men and um, the return of core warfare. Um, but what concerns me is that it, the ability of a fairly democratized technology with low capital costs, low bar business barriers to entry as well, to be employed in a way that can expedite um, adversarial decision making as well as the, their ability to really employ that decision, whatever the decision that is, in the battlefield. Um, and so I guess w what I'm curious is, is, this, is artificial intelligence um, the, sa the same hype or no hype as cybersecurity or uh, big data or blockchain or any of these other kind of shiny pennies, um, so to speak. Um, and is this, is this really um, a game changer when it comes to how we think about uh, basic and applied R&D, how we think about how we orient around our force structure, things like well, that? Well, I mean, I'll start. And, Please. And I won't use a lot of time. I mean, the, if my answer is how can you know? Um, you, you can't afford to put yourself in a position where you don't know um, because a reasoned technical individual say, would say there could be something there. We're at its infancy. We're, mm -hmm. We don't have a mature adult in front of us in AI. We have an infant. Mm -hmm. But we can conclude reasonably that there might be some real advantages and we can't let others mine. We can't let others, others be the only one to mine those advantages, particularly, particularly in a world where if, if the global level powers all have nuclear weapons, it's, it's really hard to envision serious kinetic strikes on each other's infrastructure. I yeah. mean, you can envision air battles and sea battles, but it's, it's a whole different level to imagine China striking our mainland or we theirs or any other nuclear mm. power. So given that, and given the desire of different cultures and different nations to prevail over others, which I don't see going away, uh, much as it might be nice, um, given the desire of nations to prevail over others, they will seek other means to do so. And cyber attacks and AI and other, other possibilities will naturally occur. I mean, I've often said, uh, I've often called attention to um, the dependence of the U.S. economy on the GPS timing signal. Yeah. Now that has, it has become popular to point that out. I, I like to think that I was one of the more paranoid people for spotting it earlier. 
but ir irrespective of that. Um, you know, so you have to ask yourself the question, if, if half the U.S. economy goes down because we don't have the GPS timing signal to allow encrypted financial transactions to take place, then in what sense can the national security establishment say that they're defending the nation? I mean, maybe no bricks and mortar were pounded into dust, but, you know, two days without electricity in New York goes feral. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've been there. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the number of, in, a, in an advanced society, the number of different ways to be vulnerable increases greatly, and AI and cyber and some of these other newer realms offer possibilities to our adversaries to do that. We must see to it that we cannot be surprised. Let me Ivana, stop there. Yeah, and, and, and while, while you guys are talking, if you can weave in as well, the, I think a, a good point that Mike brought up around um, escalation dynamics as well. If you have a, a technology that can easily ratchet up um, the, um, the potency of the, the strategic corporal, so to speak, yeah, so uh, whether I was they're in the Donetsk about, basin yeah. or somewhere else. I mean, so like, so information warfare, information operations is one of the um, places. And um, and speaking of hyper warfare, I think that is a very good example of hyper warfare because, you know, there's there's a website online I forget the name, but it's essentially WordPress for Twitter bots. So in like ten minutes, you can create your own Twitter bot. Anyone can do it. Um, it's slightly terrifying to think about because you know. Bots by themselves are like a lot of corporations use bots on Twitter. So when you're writing like, hey, American Airline, like my flight was delayed, blah, blah, blah. The first line of response that you get from American Airline on Twitter, that's a bot, right? So like it's not bad, but the fact that every that someone can create a bot. That explains so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that, you know, and so if someone can create a Twitter bot in 10 minutes and use it for whatever purpose they want, that is very concerning, and so, um, so I teach at NATO, and I always say this, which is that information warfare um, is sometimes can be seen as even more dangerous than the arms race because there's no mutually assured destruction. Like, what is the consequence of the entire in internet being flooded by bots? A, 70% of us probably would not even know that there were bots, right? B, like, we don't have an alternative to the internet. Until like like until quantum internet is invented and stable enough, like we have to use it. Right. Um, and then going back to the hype about AI, I think there is a lot of hype, but I also think that it's the hype is there because a lot of people don't understand what it is. So everyone's talking about it like they know what it is, but a lot of them don't. And so it's a very abstract way of think of talking about it that actually undermines the amount of time we could be spending talking about real AI problems. Interesting. Pat? Yeah, just w one other thing to add. These are r really terrific um, thoughts here. You know, th there's this tendency to just black box AI, right? AI is this big black box computer. You throw in a bunch of training data, you calculate a bunch of weights, you run it, and you get magic answers out of it, right? Well. That doesn't, that's, that's really not a great way of, of evalu evaluating either you or your adversary's you know, decision-making process or, or, or creating um, you know, effects. I think you know, when, you, when you untangle um, you know, this, this, this hype around AI, it's an important tool and I think we need, whether our adversaries have it or not, I think we need to have that arrow in our quiver to support you know, the decision-making processes, uh, the the pulse-to-pulse -pulse bite that ha fight that happens in the electronics uh, regime. This, you know, you're talking about these bots, you know, talk about swarms, Perdix, you know, coming at, th these are swarms. These, are, these bots are essentially a, another form of swarm. And we've got to have machines that can carry out and execute the things that we need them to do mm -hmm. in the battle space. And that's where I think we need to take artificial intelligence and machine learning for our customers. Great. Well, we have about five minutes left for questions. So um, people with the mics, we got one there. Uh, we have a question right up here in front, please. And please uh, give your name and uh, identify yourself, too. Thank you. Patrick Tucker from Defense One. For Dr. Griffin, you just mentioned a moment ago how 
you were kind of uh, ahead of the cool kids on uh, urgency regarding U.S. GPS reliance, particularly in, uh, across the economy and not just for defense. What, as you uh, put together 10 areas or so, as you've said, where you're going to be looking to make investments for the future of uh, research and development for the Defense Department, what are some of the key areas that are emerging as threat areas that have been left out of the larger conversation uh, that you're going to be paying particular attention to? Well, the kind of priorities for the research and engineering uh, secretariat are uh, not secret, and we didn't just think them up. Uh, if you read the National Defense Strategy, the unclassified version, they call out, you know, 10 or a dozen areas where the United States really needs to modernize its national security establishment. So, for example, well, AI is one of those, and that's what we've spent this panel talking about, but another is quantum computing. Well, I'm on a mission to change that to quantum science because the potential engineering applications of, of quantum science now, um, you know, a hundred or so years after the scientific invention of the discipline go include, but go well beyond computing. Um, hypersonics, I, I think, you know, any open publication in the defense arena uh, will provide you with ample evidence that, that China now has a significantly advanced offensive hypersonic capability that uh, the United States needs to have and, and does not yet. Um, directed energy weapons, we, we as, as a result of the urgency of the Mideast war, um, you know, something like a decade ago, we started scaling back our investments in directed energy. Um, well, even with the world's best AI, let's assume perfect AI, to counter a, 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 dro a swarm of drones might be difficult to do that with physical bullets. I might need directed energy to, to be able to shoot what I can target, as one example. Um, the microelectronics industry uh, was very worrisome, and I believe properly so, to those who crafted the national defense strategy. Uh, it used to be that on purely economic and performance grounds alone, leaving aside trust issues, United States microelectronic vendors led the world. People wanted to buy U.S. microelectronics because that was the best stuff. That's not so anymore. Um, we need to fix that. So those are a few of the areas, and I have a few more. <laughs> let me uh, let someone else have a turn. Questions? Up there in the front, please. So in the lead up to World War II, I'm Matt Ryan with the Council for Emerging National Security Affairs. In the lead up to World War II, there was a usability gap um, specifically with respect to technologies like aircraft then. Um, Dr. Singer mentioned this earlier, but is there gonna be a usability gap when it comes to AI and human capability to remain in the loop? Or is it just a matter of computing power when we decide who's gonna have that bad day? Go for it, Ivana. <laughs> uh, the short answer, since I see the stop sign, is uh, yes, there, there, there will be a gap. And it's something that was actually highlighted in 2016, is that we need to start retraining the workforce to actually start to think, of, or to retrain the workforce to um, work directly with semi-autonomous or AI in general. Um, because right now, it's pretty, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of just an ad hoc process that people sort of just learn on the fly, but I don't think there's any like comprehensive training. Yeah. Pat, any last thoughts? Uh, I, I mean, this, this idea of, of finding a gap, you know, that, that AI will either fill or be threatened to have overmatch, I think it's, you know, this is a decision that we have to make as a nation. You know, if we believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning has that level of impact, then I think it's up to us to take the, the proper steps to recognize that impact, to provide both the investment and the encouragement and the, and the national sort of infrastructure to allow it to blossom and, and take advantage of it. Great, well, big things I learned, number one, uh, 
the customer service I talked to apparently isn't you know, so much uh, customer focused. Uh, number two, most of the people, the brave souls who follow me on Twitter are apparently Twitter bots. Uh, and number three, uh, um, I, I would sure like to see more engagement and interaction between uh, three representatives such as yourself. I feel most of the discussion, not just around AI, but around technology in general, uh, could use more of this and less of, uh, you know, people just wearing suits, so to speak. Wow. Uh, so. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.